Russia calls a temporary ceasefire in Ukraine in observance of Orthodox Christmas. Hello, I'm Arnold Neidem and this is The Heat. The Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered his military to carry out a 36-hour ceasefire on the front lines of Ukraine for Orthodox Christmas and urged the Kyiv government to do the same. Putin's announcement came just hours after the head of the Russian Orthodox Church called for such a ceasefire to allow Orthodox Christians to attend services. On Thursday, the Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan spoke with the Russian president and Ukrainian president Volodymyr Zelensky in separate phone calls in an effort to find a diplomatic solution. That's the latest. Now for more on the Russia-Ukraine conflict, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Maryland is Michael O'Hanlon. He's a senior fellow and director of research in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. Here in Washington, D.C., Anton Fedyashin is a Russian affairs expert and professor of history at American University. From Providence, Rhode Island, Vladimir Goldstein is the chair of the Department of Slavic Studies at Brown University. And Pavlo Kukta, who in 2020 served as the acting minister of economic development, trade and agriculture in the Zelensky government. He joins us from Kyiv. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Pavlo, um, the Russian president has ordered this 36-hour ceasefire to mark the Orthodox Christmas. The initial um, order came from the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. What is the Ukrainian response to it? Look, thus far it's more, uh, you know, empty words rather than anything concrete. So just today the city of Kherson, which was liberated quite recently by Ukrainian army, was shelled. Four civilians died. There is combat across the front lines. So whatever Moscow is saying, as is usual with it, uh, its words are cheap. So it doesn't really hold. Uh, but at the very least, as a Ukrainian, I'm happy they are at least talking about a ceasefire now. So at least there is some maybe very, very slight shift in the Russian position, which is a good sign, I believe. But you have to understand that the realities on the ground are the same. It's a war and the Russians are shooting. So despite the ceasefire uh, coming into effect, you've seen violence continue? Absolutely, yes. Nothing has changed materially. Anton Fedyashin, let's move uh, to this latest effort to get some kind of talks to get a negotiated settlement. The Turkey president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has held separate calls, as I said, with President Putin as well as President Zelensky of uh, Ukraine. That's another effort to try and get a negotiated settlement to this conflict. What do you make of this effort? Well, I think this has more to do, Anand, with um, uh, President Erdogan trying to sort of cement uh, a place uh, for himself as the, the chief negotiator and chief moderator. Several uh, world leaders, including the head of China, have been, uh, you know, trying to play that role. Erdogan is simply there uh, ahead of everyone else. We'll see if anything actually comes of this. Um, I, I can certainly see a combination of uh, moves. Uh, whereby a ceasefire, no matter how tenuous, having given um, both sides a taste of uh, peace, uh, if it actually uh, holds starting tomorrow, um, uh, this may become the first step towards what promises to be a very long and tortuous negotiation uh, process. But I think it is way too early mm -hmm. to actually um, hope for anything, because as Pavla correctly said, uh, both sides are shooting. Donetsk is being shelled on a daily basis um, since the 24th of February, and with increasing and decreasing um, severity since uh, the spring of 2014. Um, so, I, unfortunately, I, you know, I want to be hopeful about this, but uh, until uh, the two sides are sitting at the table, this is more wishful thinking. Well, Anton, uh, President Erdogan may want to see himself as some kind of grand statesman, as a mediator in this conflict, but more importantly, does he have the ear of both President Putin and President Zelensky? He does on it. Um, he's actually one of the few world leaders who uh, has uh, stable, decent uh, relations with both Kiev and um, Moscow, uh, closer with Moscow, by the way, simply because of the economic ties between um, Turkey and uh, Russia. 
uh, but he's also listened to in um, in Ukraine. Ultimately, of course, it, it's not the moderator who will make the the you know the final contribution. It will be the two sides uh, when they decide to sit down at the negotiating table. And so far, I haven't seen uh, m much of a desire on either side to actually sit down and start dealing with each other. Michael O'Hanlon, what is your view on this latest effort to achieve a negotiated peace uh, in this conflict? Um, I mean, the person that's missing is the United States president. Surely the United States will have a big say on what kind of peace is reached. Greetings, well, and Happy New Year. I agree with everything my colleagues have said, but, but I would add one additional point, which is, of course, we shouldn't view this as some equal situation where the two parties are both sort of being asked to be more sort of inclined towards compromise than they were before. One country attacked the other. It's really just that simple, and it's important to remind ourselves and our viewers of that simple fact. Russia is still sitting on about 17 percent of Ukrainian territory, and Russia started this war. Those two facts haven't changed and won't change. And so I can't really blame Ukrainian friends for saying, sure, we'll talk peace as long as Russia gets all the way off all of our territory and agrees to pay reparations and have war crimes uh, trials for those who have killed our citizens. Having said all of that, that's probably not a realistic end game. Mm -hmm. And the United States is, as you suggest, going to have to start thinking about what kind of nudge it might give to Ukrainian friends in the course of this upcoming year to try to do things like, let's say, joint sovereignty for certain disputed territories, or some kind of a new security architecture that would help protect Ukraine without bringing it into NATO. We're going to have to be creative on this front. I'm not sure today or this month is quite the moment, mm. but pretty soon it will have to be the moment. And I think the United States will have to, as you, as you imply, uh, start being a little bit more assertive, a little more creative in how it plays a role in the diplomacy as well. Michael, as you say, Russia is sitting on 17 percent of Ukrainian territory, and that uh, is not going to change now or in the near future. That sounds like it's going to make any kind of peace settlement extremely elusive, because Russian President Vladimir Putin has said as well that the Ukrainians have to accept these what he called territorial realities on the ground. Yeah, well, I would say a couple of things uh, without giving any kind of sucker to Vladimir Putin, mm. uh, who I think, you know, deserves moral and political responsibility for this war. Having said that, the reality is that it's going to be very hard for Ukraine to win back Crimea or eastern Donbass with any kind of military offensive that I can envision. And so what are the fallback options. One might be some kind of joint sovereignty, like we've seen, for example, in parts of Bosnia, with the Bridgeco Corridor that both Serbs and Bosniaks uh, claim simultaneously, but they agree to outsource control and administration to uh, a local government. And both sides continue to maintain their claim of sovereignty. But in practical terms, it was a group made up of equal numbers of different ethnic groups who ran the place. That's the kind of model. Or you could say, let's have a referendum on Donbass or Eastern Donbass, but let's have it in 2040. And you just get it to a point where neither Putin nor Zelensky nor anybody else who's currently involved in this uh, dispute is likely to be around in a lead leadership position. So you try to essentially change the conversation delay the resolution. Those are the kinds of creative ideas I think we're going to have to consider. Vladimir Goldstein, Russia recently suffered a devastating strike by Ukrainian forces, losing up to 89 of its troops. In fact, uh, that's the Russian figure. Ukraine says that figure is closer to 400 troops that Russia lost. Um, is the Kremlin right now under any kind of pressure to get to the negotiating table? Well, Russians always wanted to get to the negotiating table, but I think the situation is who they're going to talk to and what are the terms of negotiation. Because, you know, what, what we have to avoid is taking this myopic view that this is only about 17 percent of Ukrainian territory, as Michael said. This is not quite the case. We should look at the map of Eastern Europe and look at the expansion of NATO. That's how Russia look at, look at it. And, you know, I, I suspect, like, you know, bigger junk 
of Eastern Europe now has NATO forces. And Russia was very much concerned with it. So basically, Russians have to negotiate, and that was the, the, the very beginning with NATO countries, and you know, as uh, you know, your guest noticed, Biden and Americans are not interested yet in negotiating about these issues, about addressing Russian security concerns. So I think just narrowing it down to a particular place on the map while dismissing this bigger picture is, is not quite correct. So that's how Russians feel about it, and they'll be more than happy to negotiate to make sure that there is a secure peace for everyone concerned, including people in Donbass, including pe people in Kiev and Lviv, and including people in, in Eastern Europe, but not when NATO expands and mm -hmm. threats increase and when the uh, United States declares that their purpose is to weaken Russia by all means possible. So, you know, how can Putin negotiate on these terms? What about those proposals that Michael mentioned a moment ago about the possibility of uh, defusing the crisis right now, but having a referenda of some kind in the future in these disputed territories like Crimea, like the Donbass? I think this is important, uh, is important things to do, but it's also, as I said, you know, one of the you know, bones of contention was precisely this expansion of NATO. And, you know, NATO took this very aggressive position, saying it's not our concern, it's let Ukrainians decide. So until Russians hear something very, very concrete about, you know, say, you know, not just Donbass, but about Western Ukraine and so on. And I want to mention it on this notice with the idea of the truce which Russians proposed, which should go back, you know, a century or so ago to the truce of First World War. You know, it was proposed in, 20, in uh, you know, 1914. It lasted for, for a couple of days, and then the war waged on for another four years. So I think if this is the scenario that, mm. that all recalcitrant parties want, then, you know, be it. But, you know, we have to face the reality. It's not only 89 Russians will be killed, a lot of people will be killed. So the war is not a solution. That was, should be clear to everyone. But for time being, war is, seems to be a solution for a lot of interested parties, and a lot of people make money on it. And that's what has to be addressed as well. Michael, what is your view on that? I mean, Vladimir Goldstein makes the point that the Russians don't see this as a war against Ukraine. They see it as a war against NATO. And as Vladimir Goldstein said, looking at that 17 percent of Ukraine that Russia currently occupies is what he called a myopic vision. No, I, well, leave that last point aside. I basically agree with the professor. I think that this has to be seen in the context of what's been happening in Europe over 30 years. And frankly, I have always been a critic of NATO expansion uh, in the way it's been done, not because I think it justifies this Russian aggression, and not because I think that all Russian critiques of NATO expansion were legitimate or accurate, but because we could, we could have George Kennan and Mikhail Gorbachev and others identified an element of Russian strategic thought that was bound to get very prickly and very defensive and, and maybe even a little paranoid about this kind of a policy. And I wrote a book five years ago proposing a different security architecture for Eastern Europe in which Ukraine and Georgia would not be part of NATO, but also that Russia would have obligations to take its forces off of Ukrainian territory and stop supporting the separatists and stop acting as if it had a right to determine the sovereign future of those countries. So yes, I, I think we have to see this in a broader context. And I do not favor bringing Ukraine into NATO in the future. I have been writing with a colleague, Lise uh, uh, Howard, about how we should think of a new security architecture, even at this point, that would be designed someday even to include Russia, not while Putin's president, but some future day. Keep NATO in the meantime, figure out ways to help Ukraine stay stable and secure after any peace we may obtain, but don't try to bring Ukraine into NATO because that's just bound to irritate Russians. It's just the way Russians look at the world. And frankly, uh, even though I don't agree with their worldview, I think I can understand it because if Canada was trying to join the Warsaw Pact, we'd be pretty upset too. Pablo, uh, let's look at the situation uh, in the conflict right now. The United States and Germany have agreed to supply Ukraine with the uh, powerful new armored infantry vehicles. Um, Germany has also said that it will boost Ukraine's air defenses. All this has been announced just in the past few days. Uh, how does that change the battle? Uh, look, I divide the 
this issue in two, right? The air defenses are essentially a measure to protect the civilian population. Because what Russia has resorted to in the recent months is uh, something akin to terrorist tactic. They try to take out the electricity grid in Ukraine to leave people without power, to cause as much mayhem and destruction and suffering as possible to probably, in their view, force the population to accept their demands or whatever. Though they are mostly having an adverse effect. Mm -hmm. It, it uh, you know, makes Ukrainians angry and uh, even less willing to to compromise with them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that's essentially a humanitarian measure. I'd look at it like mm -hmm. that. And it doesn't really uh, aggravate Russia in any way. Uh, as for the vehicles, yes, they help boost uh, the Ukrainian military. And I actually think that's a good thing now. And it's good that the West continues to provide these things. And I mm -hmm. think uh, they should continue to expand for the very basic reason that to end this war, uh, we need Russia either to uh, agree to some kind of stable peace arrangement, which would obviously require them to retreat from the territories they at least partially occupy right now, at the very least those taken after February 24th, after they invaded, or they have to push be, be pushed out of that, and mm. for that Ukraine needs weapons. And as you know, the initiative is right now with the Ukrainian military, so we're slowly uh, pushing them out of the country, which is also a way to resolve this conflict, right? Essentially beat them back and force them to the negotiating table. So I believe we are moving in the right direction in that regard. And I really hope to actually see peace in 2023. Granted, and there were quite a few problems raised with that here in this discussion, which were all quite correct. And there will be, have to be some pretty tough and pretty inventive answers mm. uh, to those problems. But I think we are getting there. So I am hope, more and more hopeful with every day, actually. And I think the Western supplies are helping that process. So we are moving in the right direction. We're helping bring this conflict to a close. What about day-to-day -day life for Ukrainians? You know, I talked earlier about that strike against Russian positions, which killed 89 Russians. But the Russians have all for been striking uh, Ukrainian positions, energy infrastructure. Uh, we are now in midwinter. How, how are Ukrainians coping? Mm, the new year was pretty tough. So there was a kind of an attempt to essentially terrorize the population. So the strike was not really aimed even at energy facilities. It was just aimed randomly at the capital city of Kiev and around it, mm -hmm. mostly done with Iranian-produced drones, actually, but almost all of them were shut down. So the anti-air defenses have gotten pretty tough in Ukraine, and uh, they are getting better by the day. Uh, so hopefully it will be getting better from here, and then in two months it's going to be warmer. Uh, once it's warm, uh, really the tactic doesn't make sense, because even now it's warm the, these last few days. The Russians aren't striking, and there is... Uh, electricity available almost all the time uh, because the consumption drops significantly when the weather becomes warmer. Right. So again, this problem is kind of resolving itself partly uh, simply by this change of seasons and partly by the fact that Ukrainian anti-air defenses have strengthened significantly. Mm -hmm. Anton Pryoshin, the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, he said on Thursday that Russia has shown a willingness to tolerate losses and suffering and that it should not be underestimated. What do you read into that? Well, I read into that that uh, uh, at least um, Jan Stoltenberg is realizing that the initial Western policy towards Russia, both sanctions and uh, weapon supplies to Ukraine have had a much smaller effect on Russia than uh, the West intended, and that everyone's staring down the barrel of a very long-term uh, conflict. Uh, and I hear what Pablo uh, is saying, I'll just disagree with one thing. Um, the front uh, lines are currently moving in Russia's favor, unfortunately, for the Ukrainians. Um, after the Russian withdrawal from the north and Kharkiv, uh, around Kharkiv, um, and then in the south, uh, around Kherson, the front lines have stabilized, and the Russians are slowly grinding away at the Ukrainian positions. Uh, even the Institute for the Study of War, based here in Washington, which certainly cannot be suspected of any pro-Russian um, sentiments uh, is admitting that the Ukrainian military losses, I mean, men in the field, 
are uh, disastrous, especially around Bakhmut. And I'm not uh, sure how long Ukraine can sustain uh, those kinds of losses. This is still a war of uh, attrition, and I think Stoltenberg realizes that. Um, and the Russians simply have more resources to uh, burn through. In wars of attrition, sustainability is the key to success. And success, by the way, is a very long-term um, uh, proposition. Uh, and uh, for the strikes that the Ukrainians have uh, performed, both very recently in Mykivka that you referred to, Anand, but also with, uh, with the destruction of part of the Crimea Bridge and um, uh, Russian uh, 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 missile depots uh, and ammunition depots in the Crimea back in the early fall. Uh, those have been exceptions to the rule that it's the uh, Russians who are doing most of the damage to the Ukrainians. So again, the grim realist in me says that uh, we're in this for the long haul until one side or the other decides to start uh, taking negotiation seriously. Vladimir Goldstein, do you believe that we are in this for the long haul? I mean, we just heard Pablo tell us a moment ago that he is hopeful that there could be a peace settlement this year, 2023. He's a little optimistic. In fact, there was a piece in uh, Foreign Policy magazine which said that peace may be a long way off in Ukraine this year. I think that, you know, both sides uh, have to realize that it's not, a win it's not a winning proposition for either side. You know, they both, in, you know, impose a lot of losses on each other, and there is a lot of suffering and pain. And, but both sides have to sit down and negotiate because originally when Russians, you know, invaded, they thought, oh, it's going to be a piece of cake and two days will be in Kiev. Then, you know, one, one, once sort of Russians sort of failed there, Ukrainians moved and, and took over Kharkiv back and Kherson, oh, in two days it's over. But, you know, okay, now sort of, you know, people in NATO, Stoltenberg and others realize Russians are willing to put up with losses, Ukrainians are willing to put up with losses. All right, they all say, like in, like in the first world, Water, which I refer, people incurred losses for four years until the whole young generation of Europeans were, were, were wiped out. So that type of a talk that we are winning, we are winning, it's a pretty kind of meaningless. You know, who, the only people who are winning, as far as I'm concerned, is you know United States manufacturers who produce all these Patriots and HIMARS and, and and sell them in big numbers. That, that's called winning. And until Russians and Ukrainians realize that they are the losers in the whole situation and sit down, but I suspect it's 89 people killed here or 100 mm -hmm. people killed there. It's not enough. So I, I think it's probably will go on for at least for for half a year. Michael O'Hanlon, of course, it's always good. It always is a big advantage to negotiate from a position of strength. Is that what the U.S. and more broadly the NATO strategy is in continuing to supply weapons to Ukraine and reinforce its, its troops? Sure, but also at first we simply had to help Ukraine survive. And it wasn't clear that Vladimir Putin's original goals were going to allow even for a sovereign state or a Zelensky or democratically elected government. So at this point, I think that you're probably correct mm -hmm. to suggest that, you know, the United States is starting to recognize this is probably going to be a negotiation over specific amounts of territory and, as was noted earlier uh, over by Professor Goldstein, over what kind of security arrangements Europe will have and Ukraine will have in the future. Mm -hmm. But there still is this concern that, in a worst case, Putin still wants Zelensky out and Ukraine under his control. So it's not just about maximizing territorial gain. And by the way, at a moral level, Ukraine deserves all of its land back. Let me be unambiguous about that. I agree with most of my colleagues who have talked about the need for realism and the reality of military stalemate. And you heard me talk about some ideas for shared sovereignty or long-term referenda earlier. Uh, but still, make no mistake, one country was attacked, the other country did the attacking. And there really isn't much moral ambiguity about this conflict. You can say we made strategic errors in the United States and in the West to expand NATO uh, because our desire to get, sort of consolidate a Europe that was whole and free was done with some naivete about how Russians would view that. So you can criticize this if you want, but it was not done with evil intent. It was not done with aggressive or imperialistic intent. Putin's the one who's attacking Ukraine. So I can't really blame the United States and the West for wanting to help 
Zelensky liberate as much of his country as he can. That's not really just a tactical decision. It's also a moral decision. Michael, is there a risk that this conflict in Ukraine right now could escalate to the point where it involves other European countries? There was a headline in the New York Times, I think just a day or two ago, which caught my attention. And that headline said, in Romania, U.S. troops train close to Russia's war in signal to Moscow. What does that signal? Yeah, my last answer was long, so I'll make this one short. Yes, right. I always worry about escalation. And I do think that the proximity of various forces is always dangerous, as is the uncertainty about what Putin's move, next move might be. So yes, we need to think creatively about ways to end this conflict as soon as possible. Pablo, um, we are, of course, in a new year, 2023. A United States Congress is just about to be reseated. Of course, there's a bit of difficulty among the Republicans in the House of Representatives. They still have to choose a leader. But there is a view among conservatives in the United States that once Congress is seated, once they get down to work, that aid to Ukraine needs to stop until the United States addresses its own domestic challenges. Are Ukrainians concerned about that? Mm, not particular. Again, I'm in touch with quite a few congressmen, and I really don't see that happening at all. There is a very strong bipartisan support for Ukraine. Yeah, there are some fringe voices, sometimes rather openly pro-Russian in declaring some really strange things, but otherwise all the really serious politicians are, I think, backing U.S. support for Ukraine. So I, I don't really see that happening, no. Anton Fridiashin, there were reports not so long ago that with the onset of winter, the European winter that is, there would be something of a rethink on the part of European governments uh, on their support uh, for the continuation of this war. I mean, they would still support Ukraine, but just on the war there might be a rethink. We have not seen that so far. No, we haven't. We've seen their shrinking of uh, European weapons supplies, but that's been going on for uh, months now, and it has nothing to do with winter. It has to do with the fact that the Europeans are literally running out of weapons and ammunition to supply to Ukraine. Right. Um, I think the, the, the rethink is going to be happening this spring and summer as the, the full repercussions of the energy crisis are going to be hitting European economies. Right. Um, was the Belgian president, Alexander Kroo, who several months ago actually predicted that Europe faces about five, uh, five consecutive winters that are going to be tough. So right now, Europe is uh, living through the first bout of yeah. the energy crisis. And unless this war is brought to an end and the sanctions are lifted on uh, Russia, I think the Europeans are going to be feeling the pain for years to come. So we'll see how that works out. Okay, that's where we have to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. of business is to bring value. Business activities in Europe, Asia, and the U.S. reach consumers globally. Trade, manufacturing, energy, high-tech, real estate, consumption. We give an expanded view on global business and how it covers, influences, or relates to the whole world. Global Business, only on CGTN.